But we're in, we're in the book of Acts. We've been going through this now. Uh, we're in the 29th week of our study in the book of Acts, and we have even still a couple months to go. It's a big book because it essentially walks us through when people believe in Jesus and receive the gospel and start planting churches and doing life with Jesus, how does it shape us? How does it affect our story? How does it alter the way that we think and live and move and do relationships? A lot of what Rob was just talking about, community is somewhat embedded in humanity, but there's a different kind. This is what we've been challenging our church to, to be a stirring people. There's a different kind of community when we're followers of Jesus. We open ourselves up to each other differently, and we actually are willing to be bold differently in each other's lives to stir so that we can become more like Jesus. That's a major part of this story. So we're going to get into uh, looking at Acts chapter 17 because it it shows us a little bit about this life in Jesus. Uh, Paul and his crew have been traveling. They've been moving around all over the Mediterranean, preaching the gospel and planting churches. It's a big part of what the book of Acts is, preaching the gospel and planting churches. And you might have noticed in our last few chapters or sections, when we get to a point where it talks about a church, we're trying to point out what was it about that church or what was it about the gospel that was preached there that's maybe a little bit different, that gives us a bit of a different lens of understanding. And today we're in the city of Athens, and it's actually Paul all by himself. Uh, Silas and Timothy uh, stayed back in Berea, and they come later to meet up with him. And so you have Paul just alone in the city of Athens, and we learn a ton about how to share the gospel and also what is this gospel that we are sharing, this good news that we're sharing. So I'm going to read through Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16 and going through the end of the chapter, and then we'll spend some time picking this thing apart. It says, now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens... His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. That's Luke's little commentary, by the way, on Athens. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Uh, Lord, pray that this would be helpful. 
that as we study Paul in Athens, there would just be things that are, are stirred up in us that, that teach us about how to do life as sent people. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we have been talking about these four words that uh, for the last couple of years, we felt like God's just put them on our hearts, things to process our faith through. We've talked about being a devoted people. What does it look like for us to not just show up, but to fall deeply in love with Jesus and for that to affect our whole manner of being, to be dependent on him where we live our lives in such a way that we need God's presence to do the things that we're stepping out in faith to do, to be a stirring people, to actually be people that aren't just Christians in the same space and we're content with that, but we want growth. And to grow, we need to both stir people up and to be stirred by each other. We need that, that community that agitates us towards greater Christ-likeness. We've talked about being a sent people. This is a, a fundamental belief that we have as Anthem Church that we see in the scriptures that every single follower of Jesus is, we use the phrase, on mission. Now we're here for a purpose. There's a reason that when you give your life to Jesus, you're not instantly sucked up into heaven and eternity has begun. If you think about that, you know, Jesus telling the uh, fellow robber on the cross, today you will be with me in, you remember the word he uses? Paradise. Paradise sounds pretty amazing. The idea of just of being in eternity and maybe not being here anymore, for some of us, that's like, well, that's really appealing but there's a reason that God doesn't just end your life the minute you say yes to Jesus. It's because he has purpose for you here. You're on mission to bring the name of Jesus to this world. So there's strategies or practices or habits of being sent people that we want to cultivate as a church. And Paul demonstrates a few of them in his time in Athens. And I, I want to point these out. And then we're going to look at his actual time with the Areopagus because he says some pretty significant things there. So in the first verse, there are two things about being a sent people. The first one says this. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, that is a deep and profound phrase. <laughs> Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, and I just want to start by saying, um, this is not something that I have mastered, but it is something that I am working on. And that's the amount of things that God can do in the in-between times in our lives. The things that God can do when we aren't where we're supposed to be just yet, we're on our way somewhere, and that could be physically moving from city to city, or sometimes we're just in holding patterns in our life, waiting for the next major transition, waiting for, for some of us, the other shoe to drop, waiting for things to develop, and we're just, we're here. Sometimes we like to fill our time so full that we're not just here. Our minds are already in the next place, our hearts are already in the next place, and we're not present with what God has for us in that moment. And that's true on a, on a large scale, but it, it boils all the way down. And again, I, I don't do this perfectly, but I want to point it out. It boils all the way down to the culture realities that we deal with that we don't wait well. You get to a stoplight, you check some scores. You're waiting in line at the store and you're just seeing what's new and flipping through. I don't even open apps. I just flip through the pages of the phone sometimes, and I just find myself like, what app do I think that I want to open up right now? And we find ourselves just here so much of the time that very little can happen while we're waiting. And I just wanted to encourage you with this. Just steps of growth to move towards being present where you are and understanding that God wants to use the in-between moments to be working through you into the lives of other people. Just a, a little challenge. I saw that and I was like, that, that hits and that hits in a big way how much we miss because we just don't wait very well. We don't wait for the next thing. So while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, and the second thing that it says is his spirit was provo provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols, his spirit was provoked within him. Now, this isn't talking about the Holy Spirit being provoked within him. This is talking about Paul's, just his inner person. 
the thing in him that just kind of chews away at him when he looks around at the town that he's in. And this is an aspect of being in a place and understanding where does that place miss the gospel. And this is true in every city that you'll go into, every town across the world. There are fundamental misses of what the world is doing and where God would take them if people gave themselves over to God. Part of our job as sent people is learning how to see with spiritual eyes the community that we live in and understanding what are some of the misses, what are some of the gaps. And as Paul was in Athens and he looks around and even just reading descriptions of Athens, there were temples to dozens of gods. They had built up, and and by the way, Athens at the time that Paul's there is way past its prime. So its prime was about 500 years before this, and it, it, it just had become a place that had sort of emptied out. At one time, it had a population of uh, hundreds of thousands of people, and they're saying at the time that Paul was there, that might have whittled down to like 30,000 people. There had been multiple wars that had rolled through. Temples had been burned down. Temples had been rebuilt. Athens is a city that's kind of a shell of its former self, but Paul gets there, and he's looking at, at this, and he's just, his spirit is provoked. There's something missing here. Now, I I love Thousand Oaks. I was born and raised here. Well, I wasn't born here. I was born in Tarzana. I don't know why you guys didn't use Los Robles. But I was born and raised here. (laughs) Insurance. Um, (laughs) I love this place. Uh, I go for a lot of morning walks and just spend time praying. I love our city. I love looking around and just seeing. It's beautiful. It's an incredible place. But this is not a place that if you just lived here and you made no effort to pursue Jesus, that all of a sudden you would be a faithful follower of Jesus. It is filled with distraction, filled with idolatry, full of sinful tendencies. As beautiful and wonderful as Thousand Oaks is, it doesn't, as an entity, take you towards walking with Jesus, it actually will take you away. If you just give yourself to the culture of Thousand Oaks and Ventura County, it will take you away from a passionate pursuit of Jesus, not towards a passionate pursuit of Jesus. And so many of us, when we move here, we want all of the things of this community. We want all the joys of the things that it has for our families and the parks and the schools and the sports and the the ways that we can just be involved in mountain biking and hiking and going to the beach and the Ventura County Fair and all the wonderful things. We went to the fair. It's overrated. It was was fine. (laughs) But it's, it's full of opportunity, and part of our job as believers is not to just give in to everything that's here, but to look at this place through that lens of, Lord, what do you want to do to disrupt this place? What do you want to do to turn this place upside down? It needs it. But what is here that needs to be flipped on its head? And Paul went to three specific places. He went to the synagogue, so sort of the, the Jewish center. He went to the uh, Agora, the marketplace. He would go to where everybody just goes to get their their goods. There's a a huge market just under the Areopagus, uh, near the Acropolis in Athens, and it would be the place where everybody would go to do business. He went there, Uh, and then eventually he'll go to the Areopagus as well, which is kind of like the the civic center court type of a place. And just to, to point out, Paul looked at these three places. He went to a place where he had connection. He had a Jewish story, and so the the synagogue would be a place of commonality, and then he stepped out into a world that would have zero connection to him. And the agora would be a place, the marketplace would be a place that Paul would go to just interact with people that know nothing about Yahweh or Jesus or the crucifixion and resurrection or any of the events that happened in Jerusalem just 15 years before. They would know nothing of those events, and he started preaching about Jesus. And one of the things that happens, and it can get a little lost in translation, but as he's preaching Jesus, he's uh, sort of confronted or approached by two different groups of philosophers. Now, these are two of the groups of philosophers. Athens had been known for its philosophizing for hundreds of years. Uh, Plato had set up a school there. Epicurus had set up a school there. The Stoic philosophers had set up a school there. There were these 
We call them schools of thought, but there were literal schools that would teach these thoughts, and they would, they would have groups of philosophies, and they believed different things. The Epicureans and the Stoics believed totally different things about the world, how we got here, what is true in the, the metaphysical or spiritual world or the material world. They, they believed totally different things, yet they were hearing Paul, and they were recognizing there's something totally different with the message that he's preaching. And so they actually grabbed him, the the phrase, and I'll just kind of go back to this real quick. It says, he was reasoning in the synagogue and then in the marketplace. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And they were curious, what does this babbler wish to say? And said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. Now, this is an interesting moment. It says, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Now, we can look at that and say, oh, they invited him to this place of philosophizing. That's not actually what happens. That word took is they seized him, and they took him before the Areopagus, which is actually a council. That idea of Paul preaching foreign divinities means that Paul was introducing a new religion to Athens, and the city council essentially determined whether they would allow that new divinity, that new religion to enter into the city, or if they would not allow it. So Paul had to go before a council and present essentially what he was preaching so that they could then determine if they were going to let, say, a church get started in Athens or let this teaching continue or if they were going to expel him from the city. So that's a little bit about the context of what happens. So now Paul's going to be standing before the Areopagus. So consider this a a council similar to like our Supreme Court where, yes, they will hear cases about actual trials, but they also do some of like the ethical dialogue around our nation. They'll actually try and determine just some of what do we understand to be true and how do we then make laws based on that. That's the role that the Areopagus fulfilled. And so this council would listen to Paul and the things that he was teaching, and they were there to make decisions. So Paul, as he goes before the Areopagus, is presenting to them a basic foundation of Christian thought. Now, I want to just share a couple of things about this. You, you can look at this and say, Paul never mentions Jesus. How do you establish a basic understanding of Christian thought if he doesn't mention Jesus once? He does mention the resurrection, a man who was resurrected. So he'll, he'll get there in a roundabout way. But maybe to help understand this, uh, over the course of my life as a pastor, I've been doing this for 20, I don't know, 25 years, something like that. Um, I've gotten to do somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 weddings. And uh, some of those weddings have been with non-Christian couples. So people that just will get my name or they'll know somebody that goes to the church and ask if I can officiate their wedding ceremony. And I'll sit with these couples beforehand. And if you've ever been a part of a wedding that I've done, it's a chance to share Jesus. Because Jesus is at the center of marriage. The whole entity or concept of marriage is designed to show the covenant love that God has for his people. That's what marriage is according to the scriptures. And so you can stand up there at a non-Christian wedding and say those things and people are just like, what is going on here? And so as I sit with these couples, I'll, I'll tell them this. I will say, look, I don't need to say everything that I do believe, but I won't say anything that I don't believe. It is their day. I'm not going to just say, here, listen, I'm going to preach the gospel whether you like it or not. But I do give them, I give them some room to talk about what goes into the ceremony and what doesn't go into the ceremony because the reality is it's their wedding day. But if they ask me to say that, uh, you know, all we need is love or, you know, just, hey, love is a, a, a beautiful thing and it's the center of the universe and it brings people together and that's why we're getting married. I won't, I won't say stuff that I don't believe because that's rubbish. So... Sorry. I try not to be too opinionated with people when they say things. But I'm getting at this by saying, as Paul goes to the Areopagus, he's not saying everything that we do believe, but there's nothing that he says that we don't believe because he wants to build a framework for how to establish whether the Christian gospel will be preached in this community or not. And in doing this, he does something really interesting. If you think about when Paul went to Thessalonica, he spent weeks reasoning with the Thessalonians about how Jesus is the Christ. Luke tells us that uh, in Acts chapter 16, how Jesus is the Christ. And in Athens, he has to start way before that. Because if he went to this 
Areopagite council, and he said, listen, let me tell you about how Jesus is the Christ. They would say, who's Jesus and what's the Christ? They would have no framework for what he's talking about. And so he goes back to the very beginning. And here, I just want to take some time and talk about this basic Christian worldview. And I'm hopeful that this is helpful in two ways. First is as sent people, it's important to understand a basic Christian worldview so that we know as we go into different people groups, different cultures, different uh, ways of believing, we understand what we believe and how we might engage people who live with a completely different worldview, totally different lenses through which they see the world. So that's one. But the, the second is this. A lot of us are a part of a church, but we've never really let our thinking fully adapt to what is true in the scriptures. And there can be a, a constant unease or dissonance that exists in us when the things that are being preached don't really line up with the things that maybe we believe internally. So some of what I'm about to say might be a little bit of chiropractic work even for your own worldview to help you understand what the Bible teaches about God because that does need to line up. There is a, as we come to Jesus, there's a, a submission in our hearts to, I may not know everything, I may not know the, the way to say all of these things, yet God does and he communicates things. So how do I receive and adopt and implement God's view of the world in order to live appropriately? So let's take a look at what Paul speaks to here. So he starts with this common ground. He says, I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, and I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So he starts by just entering in through maybe a path of common ground, an altar to an unknown God. And he says, essentially, I have an idea about this unknown God. What, therefore, you worship as unknown. This I proclaim to you. The first thing Paul says is the God who made the world and everything in it. The God who made the world and everything in it. The first thing that we need to understand as a Christian and our worldview, the way that we see the world, is that God is the creator of everything. He's the author. He spoke it into existence. John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. God is the creator of the universe, all things. And there was nothing made that he didn't make. God is the author of all things. Colossians 1, 16 says, for by him... Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All, thing, all things were created through him and for him. Colossians adds in that not only is he the creator, but these things were created for him. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days... He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So part of our, our basic understanding is that God made the world. He created it. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. God is the source of life. And as we look at God, we do need to understand him through that lens of God as creator. A starter. That's an important part of this. The second thing that Paul preaches, and by the way, that would have been completely contradictory to anything that the Greeks would have understood about how the world came into existence. Both the Epicureans and the Stoics would have had entirely different worldviews about how the world came into being. So Paul's introducing a shocking belief. that This God that he's preaching about is the creator of all things. And then he goes into the next thing. Being Lord of heaven and earth. Being Lord of heaven and earth. Now, we use the word Lord pretty like chill. You know, I think a lot of us pray using Lord. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for this meal. All is good in the world. Amen. We use the word Lord just like nothing. But the word Lord has this element of master, ruler, king, authority. 
that God is over all and through all and in all. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.15, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. There's an element of when we look to God, we look at him as the authority in the world. We submit to him. God's not our genie in a bottle that he submits to us. He's not here to make our life better. He is Lord and King. He's the ruler of all things, and we submit ourselves to him. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21 says, According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Paul's just kind of wringing out that towel. He is authority over everything. He is Lord. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. See, when we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we are seating him above all else. And so for the, the Christian, that does mean that we are stepping into a place of submission. We'll talk often about saying, I gave my life to the Lord or I gave my life to Jesus. That is significant because it means that we released ourselves to him. We submitted ourselves to him, said, you are king and I'm not. You rule my life and I don't. You rule this world, and I don't. I go where you tell me. I do what you have for me. Your ways are higher than my ways, and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Now, for a lot of us, we just need to remind ourselves of this over and over and over. Because as time goes on, that just kind of switches back to, well, my thoughts are pretty good, and my ways are pretty excellent. And I feel like God should bless and honor what I think as opposed to me blessing and honoring what he thinks. And we just need to rewrite that ship and submit ourselves to him. And that's a big part of repentance is turning our minds back to him. Paul continues on. And he says, he does, talking about God, does not live in temples made by man. Now the Bible teaches us in the Old Testament that God's presence rested in the tabernacle, which was a, a tent. It was a beautiful tent, but it was a tent that Israel would take with them and they would set it up. And when they would set it up in this new place that they were, the presence of God would, would come into the tabernacle and rest in the holiest place inside that tabernacle. And the presence of God would go with Israel. And then they built a temple. And in that temple, as they blessed it and they, they committed it, God's presence came into that temple. So even Yahweh, for a time, used the space and place of a physical structure to describe his presence. But here Paul's talking about this different. He's saying, actually, this God that we worship, he's not bound by temples that we make. Even when God's presence was in the temple, Psalm 139 talks about God's presence being everywhere. And then we get to the New Covenant or the New Testament. And there's a whole different temple understanding that's given. Ephesians 1.13 says this. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What that means is when you become a follower of Jesus, you become a residing place for the presence of God. It doesn't come and go. Everywhere you go, the presence of God goes with you. The Holy Spirit is a seal. He's sealed on you, and that's the deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. This is really important for us to understand that God is not distant to the believer. He's not out there. He's not far away. He is as near as God can get. And you are as near to him as you can get in that you have been joined to him and his spirit has been joined to you. Romans 5.5 5 says, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
Maybe you've had a, a surgery before where you had to have a port of some kind put in or, or some kind of treatment where you had a port put in. And Paul uses this language of the Holy Spirit is like a port in our hearts for God's love, that his love is being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. He's just there and he's just ushering the love of God into your heart. And that's the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit is there at all times. Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. His presence. Paul takes this presence idea and makes it even more emphatic in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There's household language. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now listen to this. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now the Bible gives us two pictures. It says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and it says that you corporately, the body of Christ, the church, are being built up into a dwelling place for God by his Spirit. But none of this is made by human hands. So as Paul's just preaching to the Areopagus, he's saying, look, this God that we know is not bound by the things that we make. He's not served through that. This God is a completely different kind of God than the one that you know and the the gods that you have imagined. So then he goes on and he says this. He says, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind. This is the self-sufficiency of God, the sufficiency of God. He does not need us. Sometimes I like to think that God needs me, and he's somewhat dependent on me, and then I need to humbly repent and say I'm sorry, because he doesn't need us. Maybe you could have a cynical view of creation and say, well, God created humanity because he just wanted a bunch of peasants to serve him and worship him and God was desperate for worship so he made humanity so that we would all worship him he needs us he's dependent on us we feed his ego he doesn't need us he is in himself sufficient in fact the bible tells us that he made us out of love not out of need his own desire to be worshiped is not the reason that he made us because he is sufficient in himself. Now, for some of us, that can make us throw up our hands and say, well, God doesn't need me. He could do all this without me. And while technically, theologically, you would be correct, God has built a different kind of operation and that he brings us into the story. Remember, I told you at the very beginning, if God's objective was just to get you to heaven, Like if the end game was just eternal life, then the minute you say yes to Jesus, he could just escape you out of the world and take you away. And then you would be with him. And I still think that'd be a pretty good evangelistic proposition. Let's just say my dad gives his life to Jesus. Boom, he evaporates and he's gone. I'm like, well, that looks pretty good. Anybody that wants to leave just says Jesus and then we're gone. And it's like a teleportation to paradise And you can imagine the world would pretty quickly just catch on and be like, all I have to do is say Jesus three times and spin around in a circle and I get to go to eternity. (laughs) But God has designed things differently where when we come to faith in him, he puts his presence in us and then blesses the world through us part of the story of redemption that God could take these jars of clay, these filthy rags, and he could make something beautiful. He could redeem us and let the goodness of God come out of our mouths and out of our lives. And it's part of the redemptive story to overturn the curse that came through sin. This is what God does. He doesn't need us, but he chooses us. Paul's speaking to this 
again, to a world that thinks that somehow the, the deities and humanity are interdependent and the deities are dependent on humanity and their sacrifices and the things that they might do to get them to do the things that they ultimately want to do. And he's looking at this and saying, God is not served by human hands. And then he goes on to say, he gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Life and breath and everything. There is, I love how Paul is just like, he gives us life, he gives us breath, he gives us everything. All of it. God is not limited in his resources. He has it to give. You serve a God that has it to give. It's an important thing for the framework of a Christian to understand that we, we live in the, the world of a God who has it all, has access to it all. There's no limit to his power and his resources. And he gives us everything that we need. He gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Then Paul goes on and says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. This is just an interesting moment where Paul actually talks about the sovereignty of God. Yes, I mean, you can imagine Athens being in this place where uh, the Greeks and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Romans, all of these empires have just rolled through Athens at different points and conquered and been conquered. And there have been wild, sweeping victories from Alexander the Great and Xerxes and Artaxerxes. There have been incredible empires. And Paul's preaching and he says, yeah, God puts the boundaries on all of these things. He's the one who authors all of history. He is the sovereign. You see... One that's over all of it. Again, just reframing their entire mindset on how these things work. And he goes on and he says this. He says that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him, yet he's not actually far from each one of us. Then he quotes two Greek poets. In him we move, live and move and have our being. And as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So then Paul uses that to launch into his next phrase, being then God's offspring. Okay, this, this band that was up here today, they're from the church Imago Dei. That's a Latin phrase that means image of God. It's referencing in Genesis when Moses talks about how male and female, we are created in his image. We image God. That's not a Christian thing. It's not just Christians that are made in the image of God. It's all humanity is made in the image of God. And that's an important thing to understand. And so Paul's looking at this and he's like, look, we are the, he uses the word offspring. We're the offspring of God. We're the creation of God. We're made in his image. And so then he says, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So he's like, look at the, the frailty of this thinking. So many of your gods are represented by what you've made. The only picture you have of Zeus is the statue you've made of Zeus and the mythology that you created. Literally, their gods are from their fiction. They just write about what these gods do and how they think. And that mythology created a whole religion. And he's looking at this, he's like, how is it that we could be the creators of these gods when we are made in his image. So he's talking about the folly of idolatry, how silly it is for us to chase the things of this world when he is the one who created us in his image. We are his image as opposed to the things that, that we create. Now, that's not to say that art is worthless or anything like that. In fact, he created us to be creative. He created us to use our imaginations, but when we try and create gods, when we try and create things that we then worship or apply affection to, he's like, well, that's just, that's folly. That's folly. And then continuing on, this is where Paul then brings it down. He says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. He's looking at these Greeks that rule over a city that was completely devoted to idols, 
completely devoted to philosophies, and he, he calls that the times of ignorance. Again, these are disruptive things that Paul's saying. Athens would have been the seat of, call it intelligence, intellect in the known world. Maybe Alexandria would have been uh, right there with it, but the idea of Athens being at the center, the center of thought in that time, and Paul looks at this and says, look, the time of ignorance, God overlooked that. And now he's calling you to deal in reality. He's calling you to repent. He's calling all people everywhere to repent. And this is another one of those worldview things that's important for us to understand. Every single person on planet Earth is being commanded by God to repent because a day of judgment is coming. There's a a call to turn. We don't sit back and wait and say, well, if they're faithful enough at whatever religion of the, the country that they're born into, they'll find their way to God. That's actually not the the message of the gospel is that people are called to repent, to turn to the living and true God, to hear the name of Jesus and to respond to it. And Paul actually starts to go there. Just again, set this foundation. Look at how he puts this. He says, the time of ignorance got overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Okay, this is very strange teaching for the, for the Greeks to listen to this. God has established a standard of righteousness by one man. And then he proved that that one man was his standard of righteousness by raising him from the dead. He doesn't even mention the name of Jesus in this place, but I just want you to hear that that the Christian worldview, God put Jesus forth. We say this all the time. Jesus lived the life that none of us could ever live, and he died the death that all of us deserve to die. Jesus is being put forth as the new standard. Not for us to live up to, like, if we obey the law enough, we'll get to Jesus. We talk about this all the time. None of us is righteous, not even one. We all fall short of the glory of God. The standard that has been set by Jesus is an impossible one that no one can ever live up to. But God, being rich in mercy, has made us alive together with Jesus Christ. By his grace, we're saved. See, Paul lays the groundwork. And at that moment, when they hear the resurrection, some of them instantly dismiss him again, this is a supernatural concept talking about God raising somebody from the dead. And the Areopagus council is like, yeah, no, we're done. But a few of them said, actually, we want to hear you again on this. And they followed up with Paul and they went after him. Dionysius, Demarius, and a few others come to faith in him. We learn through church history that Dionysius becomes the bishop of Athens. That there is a church that's planted. No letter is ever written to Athens. We don't hear about Athens again. But this man that gave his life to Jesus, Dionysius, becomes a leader in the Athens church and will ultimately lead many others to Christ and be martyred for his faith. Paul laid the groundwork for that church to be set in Athens. As far as we know, the city council there would have actually then allowed for them to meet because Dionysius would have actually planted that church, but we don't know much beyond this. I just, I wanted to walk through these worldview things because as I was reading each one of them, you can look through the list and and the scholars have done this. Four of them speak specifically against the Epicurean philosophies and the other three of the major statements speak against the Stoic philosophies of the age. Paul was speaking directly to what the main beliefs of the world were at that moment and how the gospel completely upends them. And that is part of our job as sent people is to know the world that we're speaking into and how the gospel is disruptive because it is disruptive. It takes what we hold on to and it turns it upside down. Our job is not to show people how the gospel aligns with what they think, though we might find common ground. Through that common ground, we actually throw, show how it's disruptive to every single one of us. And one of the great testimonies that we carry is how it's been disruptive to us. What did you believe? Where were you going? 
What, what did you hold to be true that the gospel has uprooted? What is it still uprooting? What are the things, the idols, the things that are in your life that the gospel is still uprooting? And these are opportunities that we have to bring Jesus into a world that, that needs to know him. I did try to walk through all of these in one day. Honestly, each one of these probably could have been a sermon in terms of worldview presentation. So yes, there are lots of unanswered questions or there are many paths that you could go down with every statement that Paul made, but I wanted to walk through each one of them and just see how he is establishing this foundation of Christian thinking. This is what we hold to be true. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to invite the team up and we're going to take some time to respond. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your creation of this place, and that you are Lord and sovereign over all. Lord, we pray even now as we walk through this that we would walk in submission to you, that our minds and our thinking would be shaped to believe as you have instructed us and to live in accordance with those beliefs. Lord, we just pray that you would be doing a work in each of us. We love you, Lord. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.